Having pulled me partially into the Preterist camp, Bill continued working, now on the differences between partial and full Preterism. What was the nature of the kingdom? How did Jesus describe the kingdom? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John 18, verses 36 through 37. Notice all of the present tense terminology, is, am, now. Jesus was a king when Pilate questioned him, yet not of a physical kingdom, otherwise his servants would have fought a physical fight. Paul echoes this in Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. How can you resolve a physical kingdom with that passage? I was asked. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here, or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, verses 20 through 21. The kingdom cannot be observed? How does that fit in with a literal, physical kingdom? But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Matthew 12, verse 28. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. Luke 16, verse 16. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Mark 10, verse 15. Again, present tense. The kingdom was present in Christ's generation. In light of these passages, mustn't we re-examine those other passages which we assumed spoke of a literal, physical kingdom? And then, there is Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. John 4, verses 21 through 22. Well, knowing my track record of not scoring points against preterism so far, I didn't have a lot of confidence on this issue either. How can you argue against what's right there in the Bible in black and white, or harder yet, in red? If the kingdom of God is spiritual in nature, why are we expecting Christ to return bodily and set up a physical kingdom? My future eschatology suffered another major crack when I considered the correlation between Elijah and John the Baptist. Every Jew knew that Elijah was to come before the Messiah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 4, verse 5. When the disciples saw Jesus transfigured on the mount with Elijah and Moses, they began to understand that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But if Jesus was the Messiah, why hadn't Elijah already returned? Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Matthew 17, verse 10. You see, the disciples understood the timing of the prophecies, Elijah before the Messiah. Now here's where it gets interesting. Jesus affirmed their understanding of the timing of the prophecies. What Jesus had to correct was the disciples' concept of the nature of Elijah's second coming. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood 
that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Matthew 17, verses 11 through 13. Jesus said that Elijah had already come, but they did not know him. As the full meaning of that sank in, I began to get an awful feeling in the pit of my stomach. Wasn't that exactly what Bill was telling me about the second coming of Christ? That he had already come, but we didn't know him? The scary thing about this was the object lesson Christ had given to his disciples. They had the timing of the fulfillment right, but they were over-literalizing the nature of the fulfillment. Regardless of what some prophecy experts may tell us about John the Baptist being a foreshadow of the coming of Elijah, the Holy Spirit inspired the New Testament authors to write that Jesus said, Elijah has come, and the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. As much as we might recoil from the concept, there was a spiritual fulfillment to the second coming of Elijah. Jesus himself proclaimed that Elijah had already come, but they did not know him. That's because it wasn't the literal Elijah, but John the Baptist coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke 1, verses 13 and 16 through 17. Perhaps like me, you are not so quick to accept this spiritual fulfillment concept. What then are we to do with all the hills and valleys in Jerusalem? You see, when the Pharisees asked John the Baptist who he was, he replied by saying, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now what's interesting is Luke's expanded quote from Isaiah. Luke, describing the preaching of John the Baptist, wrote, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. And the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John the Baptist was definitely the fulfillment of Isaiah's The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness, and yet the hills and valleys of Jerusalem still exist, and there are still crooked paths and roads. So what are we to do with these hills, valleys, and crooked paths? Is it possible that these geographical hindrances to travel could be metaphors for hindrances to approaching God? Consider what Paul said to Elimus the magician. You are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Acts 13 verse 10 There is no doubt that John the Baptist fulfilled these words of Isaiah's prophecy, and yet there were no geographical changes in the environs of Jerusalem. But that's not all. Note that Isaiah also prophesied, All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Did all flesh see the salvation of God in the preaching of John the Baptist? If we insist on a strictly literal interpretation, we must answer no. Yet the Gospel writers declared that John the Baptist fulfilled these words. Therefore, these words must have something other than a strictly literal interpretation. But if that is the case in Isaiah, then what about these words? Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Revelation 1, verse 7. As much as you or I may not like the implications, there must be a spiritual fulfillment to this aspect of John the Baptist's ministry. So I begin to wonder, if the second coming of Elijah had a spiritual fulfillment, could the same principle apply to the second coming of Christ? Remember the woman at the well? Jesus told her that whoever drank from the water he offered would never thirst again. So the woman responded, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw water again. Wasn't she interpreting his words literally? 
Yet we know that Jesus did not have a literal interpretation in mind. Could this same principle of Elijah's second coming also apply to Christ's second coming?